Hi and good afternoon. Welcome to the Virtual Cambridge Union. We are delighted to be joined by Lord Heseltine, who is a senior cabinet minister in the governments of Margaret Thatcher and 25 years um, <laughs> when you were president of the Oxford Union. Now, there may be many members of this union uh, on the call who harbour political ambitions. What would be your advice to them? Well, I think the important thing is to know what you want to do. And um, my advice generally to anyone who asks that question is choose a career which means you look forward to Monday morning. I can think of nothing worse than to spend a weekend dreading going back to work. I've always been extraordinarily happy in the jobs that I've been doing and look forward to continuing with them. If you're going to go into politics, I would myself, uh, it's perhaps slightly against the fashion, I would establish an experience outside politics, uh, maybe public sector, maybe private sector, so that when you stand up and speak about something, people will at least have the confidence that you know what you're talking about. You haven't just read the latest doctrine from the central office or whatever it may be that you have personal experience, you've actually got something to show for your own abilities and, and, and endeavours. So, uh, and the only other thing I would say is that if you're half-hearted about going into politics, don't, because it is a very demanding uh, career. Uh, there are great satisfactions, but I think as Enoch Powell said, all, career, all political careers end in failure. In the end, someone brings you down. And uh, you have to face up to that. You know from the start there will be that sad morning when you're out. Do you think your experiences in the Oxford Union prepared you for later life in the Conservative Party in any way? Yes, I think that uh, I think the Oxford Union, I think the experience of Oxford University changed me out of all recognition. Uh, I came from a conventional middle class background. I came from a public school. Um, and um, uh, my record was far from distinguished. What Oxford was for me was the first time that I was exposed to the um, uh, amongst the most talented of my generation. So these were, if I was to get anywhere and do anything, this was the real competition. And of course, it came from every sort of background. Uh, and I remember when I became president of the Oxford Union, uh, two of my uh, oldest friends were ex-chairmen of the Oxford University Labour Club. And, but they supported me in my bid to be the president. And the only thing we had in common is that we all hated the Liberals and the people standing against me were all Liberals. So it was a Tory Labour alliance that made me president of the Oxford Union. Um, I think many of, our, many of our members might see history repeating itself at the moment. Um, moving on to perhaps more political questions, um, we've had a few submitted in relation to trade. Now, in terms of trade and influence, it's been said that the 19th century was Britain's, the 20th, that of the USA, and the 21st, China's. Against this backdrop, what is best for Britain um, in terms of trade in the coming century? Well, I, I, as you said, I was deeply disappointed in the outcome of the uh, Brexit referendum because uh, we are or were part of this huge, nearly 500 million people home market uh, of uh, broadly similar demands, appetites, uh, tastes. So here was an opportunity on our doorstep to sell British products uh, with, with the uh, minimum of cost in terms of transportation and inconvenience. Uh, that wasn't really what Europe was all about, but it was, in terms of trade, what it was about. And we now, um, well, who knows what the consequences of Brexit will be. We haven't begun to see, in my view, the consequences, because COVID has completely dominated the whole political world over the last 12 to 18 months. But that will change as the recovery is now proceeds, 
as it will do in, in the short term at a considerable speed. But the aftermath will come when COVID will have gone and uh, Brexit will be there very much on the agenda. But, but as to the general question, then I don't think one ought to sort of compartmentalize one's overseas endeavors. Uh, half of it may go to Europe, but you must constantly look for new markets uh, and find opportunities wherever they can be achieved. Uh, that's not to say you turn your back on your existing markets. You don't. You build on them. But you're always trying to find new avenues, new opportunities. And you mentioned the um, break with Europe, as it were. Do you think the Conservative Party has changed fundamentally beyond all recognition um, as a result of, of its handling of the European question? I don't think so, because the Conservative Party, if you look at it historically, is the most sophisticated political machine in human history. Uh, and for one very simple reason, it knows what it's in politics for. It's to achieve certain results, and they can't be achieved without power. So in a parliamentary democratic system, to get power, you have to win. And to win, you have to get a majority. And the Conservative Party, in its bones, knows this. Um, and uh, so winning elections uh, is, is absolutely core central to the Conservative Party. And my own view is that in any normal circumstance, you win elections from the center and not from the extreme. To that extent, I don't believe the Conservative Party will change fundamentally. Certainly, it changed, lurched dramatically over Brexit, uh, and much to its discredit in my view, because uh, the whole achievement of Europe was broadly done under Conservative leadership uh, after, uh, well, Churchill onwards. And um, uh, so you suddenly see the leader of the Conservative Party uh, campaigning to leave the European Union it was a, a dramatic reversal. But I doubt if that will change the nature of the Conservative Party. A question also about the Conservatives that has been submitted by George Charles reads, what do you think about the conventional distinction between Thatcherite and One Nation Conservatives? Oh, I think it's an awful lot of nonsense talk. Um, it depends which side of the argument you're on. You interpret whatever is going on uh, to suit the claims. And certainly, well, uh, of course, I was a member of Mr. Thatcher's government uh, and the opposition that led to that government. And um, I saw Mrs. Thatcher at work. Um, perhaps one of my most significant experiences was the creation of London Docklands, which was a, a very, very interventionist policy. And Margaret backed me against her principal lieutenants, Geoffrey Howe and Keith Joseph, who saw it as expensive and interventionist and tried to stop, persuade her to stop me, but, but she supported me. And at a critical moment in the fortune of Docklands, Margaret actually got on the telephone to a guy called Paul Reichman and said, look, uh, we've got a problem here, will you come and help? So there's nothing, there's nothing more interventionist than the prime minister ringing an entrepreneur in America and saying, come and help. Um, so, uh, uh, of course, the party pursued policies that, that, well, I mean, one nation conservative, for example, selling council houses. You can see that as right wing if you like. I don't. I see that as uh, uh, very much, <coughs> excuse me, as very much a, a one nation enfranchisement of a class of people who had been left behind in the property owning boom. Um, so, um, the battle against the trade unions, which of course was actually pivotal at the time, that had almost become a, 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 an agreed policy for both parties. It, the, uh, the relationship of unions and management was appalling after the war, and it got worse under all governments. And it was uh, the first sign that something was going to be done about it was under Harold Wilson, when the Minister of Labour, Barbara Cartland's castle, produced a document called In Place of Strife. And this was the first sign a government was going to stand up and be counted. 
well, we, the history is well known, the minor strike broke Ted Heath's government and it, it went on then to break Jim Callaghan's uh, government with the winter of discontent. When we came to power in 79, there was no doubt in our minds that legislating to make sure that the trade unions were within the curtilage of the law was absolutely fundamental. There was no division within the party about that. And we have a question that moves three years on from, from 79. In, in July 1981, um, after a period of severe unrest in British cities, uh, perhaps most acutely in Liverpool, the Prime Minister sent you personally to intervene, earning you the popular title of Minister for Merseyside. Um, can you talk to us about that experience and what do you think the personal qualities that, that what do you think were the personal qualities that singled you out for that role? Well, it, she didn't send me. Uh, <laughs> I said to her, we had, we had riots in some of our big cities, in Liverpool included. And um, I had a personal relationship with Liverpool, which dated back to 1979. Uh, and actually, I inherited it from my Labour predecessor, Peter Shaw. As part of his government, the Labour government's, uh, a policy initiative to try and improve the social conditions in deprived areas. He created a sort of partnership between some of the most deprived areas and one of his ministers. He himself had become a partner to Liverpool. So when I took on his job, civil service first question is, do you want to continue this? I said, yes. And I became a sort of titular partner for Liverpool. And that was 79. In, from 79 to 81, I did quite a lot of things which I thought were helpful for Liverpool. Listing the Albert Dock uh, was symptomatic of, you know, we're here to help. The Garden Festival, the creation of the, um, uh, the Liverpool D Development Corporation on the banks of the Mersey. Uh, so when the riots took place, I, I thought, well, you know, I've got a responsibility for this, which is just not the normal one. Well, quite obviously, the government had to back the, the police. Law and order must be maintained. But I went to Margaret and I said, look, uh, I'm completely on side about backing the police and restoring law and order. But I think there's something more profound going on in these urban areas. And I want your agreement to spend a lot of time in Liverpool, to walk the streets, to listen to what people are saying and try to get underneath the skin of it all. Uh, and Margaret agreed with that. That's why I went to Liverpool. She didn't send me. I, I asked to go and, and, and on another intervention mission to which she didn't object. Um, well, when I got there, in the first two or three days, it was easy. What are you doing here, Secretary of State? I've come to listen. You say we never listen, we're never here, we don't care. I'm listening. And it worked perfectly well for about three days. After about three days, inevitably, a journalist said, we've been here for three days, what do you think? And within a couple of days later, you've been here for five days, what are you going to do? And it was quite apparent to me that there was no way out uh, without humiliation unless I actually had a list of things I was going to do. And so I prepared a list of about 30 things. And why did I do that? Because the one thing that those few days walking the streets told me about Liverpool is that nobody was in charge. No one had any ideas of what they could do to help. They all knew what was wrong. You were wrong. He was wrong. She was wrong. They were wrong. Everyone was wrong. Never me. And of course, that is a recipe for failure, for disaster. And so I thought, well, okay, we better see if we can make things happen. So I produced the list. But it was no use just producing a list. I spent a day a week for the next 18 months making those things happen. I had a team of secondees from the public sector and from the private sector. They were my uh, workhorse. Uh, all day, all week, they worked at making a success of these things. And on a Thursday night, I'd have dinner with them and work out whether there was any trouble we needed to unblock, which I'd then do on the Friday. So that's where the whole thing happened. 
and um, people have been very kind about the consequences. But of course, the consequences are, are much wider than Liverpool. If you look at the, the, the achievements of the development corporation, and, learn, and, and, and above all else, learn the lesson. Somebody in charge, a body with power and resource and with planning ability to get on with the job locally based. And that is the formula which I have advocated ever since and do now profoundly that has led under David Cameron and George Osborne to the directly elected mayors um, who, who are in such a position and I believe are making a significant difference. And from there, um, you went on to lead the department, um, the Defence Department. Can you talk us through your experiences there, particularly in relation to the campaign around nuclear disarmament and the reforms you made to the department? <laughs> well, uh, yes, I, I certainly can. There were three big things about my tenure of the Ministry of Defence. First, you rightly say, was the growth of CND. Now, of course, under John Knox, we had had the spectacular success of the regaining of the Falkland Islands, and that had completely focused public opinion, understandably. But at the same time, CND had been growing. The Falklands issue resolved satisfactorily. CND was there, emerged. Uh, uh, and very obvious. And I got a letter um, within days. Congratulations, Secretary of State. You are one of the bright sparks of the Tory government. You've been put in the job of Secretary of State to defense to debate the great nuclear issue of our time. When shall we meet? Yours sincerely, Joan Ruddock, Chairman, CND. Well, it's the oldest trick in the business. You're a pressure group on the streets. You, you get some publicity, but not that much. Uh, whereas your opponent, the Secretary of State, has access to Parliament and, and the major pre press and all that sort of thing. So you want to get some sort of parity. So the debate is the technique. And um, I knew that would be absolutely fatal because, uh, again, Joan Ruddock was a very personable young lady and she would be able to talk about the threat to women from nuclear, and I would sit there as a man, sort of, you know, more or less off the debate. So I knew I had to say no, but I had a problem. As Secretary of State of the Environment a few months before, I had accepted an invitation to go to speak to the Conservative Party at Green and Common. And, uh, uh, well, again, if I'd cancelled, I'd have been seen as running away. So I had to honour the commitment. And I knew I couldn't avoid answering this letter if I go if I appeared at Newman Common. So I wrote a letter, had it typed in my pocket, explaining no, and I arrived at the meeting, and it was complete chaos. The women, the peace-loving ladies of Newman Common, were an absolutely very big mob, and the police had huge trouble in protecting my wife and myself. I actually ended up at one stage with one knee on the ground. I got so close to being overwhelmed. And, um, but we got into the meeting. And of course, all I have to say is that we will debate these matters in Parliament, not in the mob on the streets. And without any doubt, that particular uh, event did CND huge damage, because far from the peace-loving ladies, they became the mob on the street. Uh, one other thing I did, uh, a quite interesting piece of analysis. The public opinion polls at the time showed that in favor of unilateral disarmament, 70% against 30%. If you ask the question, are you in favor of one-sided disarmament? The polls showed 70% against one-sided parliament and 30% for. And so I gave instructions to my officials and everyone involved, never talk about unilateral disarmament again. 
always talk about one-sided disarmament. And actually, the issue became one of the uh, the main uh, strands of the 1983 general election, which, of course, the Conservatives won handsomely. Uh, uh, the other two issues, the management of the NOD, uh, every Secretary of State since the war had realized that the division between Army, Navy, Air Force and Royal Marines it really did not make sense in a fighting situation. And it was Lord Louis Mountbatten, who'd been Supreme Allied Commander in the Far East, who first wanted to bring about this change, but every Secretary of State had wanted to, but the, 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 the great chiefs of the individual forces had prevented it from happening. I thought it about, and I, I was quite ruthless. I, I did it without consultation, because I knew full well if I'd started any consultation, it'd been all over the papers, and I'd never got it through. I went to Margaret, and I said, Margaret, I'm going to do this, but the chief's staff will be all in here begging you to stop me, and I'm not doing it unless you agree you won't stop me, which she did, and she didn't. And so that was the, uh, the, the reorganization which has lasted to this day. And finally, I arrived um, to... Um, here to, to find out what was happening about the new generation of uh, aircraft. Um, I discovered that the French, Germans, Italians and Spanish had come to an agreement to exclude us. Um, and uh, I said, I'm not putting up with this. I managed to persuade the uh, Italians, the Germans and the Spanish to join our project. Uh, I nearly got the French. I tried it my hardest to get French but they went on their own, and the Eurofighter became uh, an allied uh, NATO weapon of massive significance in the Cold War. So those are my memories of the wonderful privilege of being Secretary of State for Defence. And as, as the 80s um, went on and you, you experienced the, the general elections throughout the 80s, did you notice a change in Margaret Thatcher's style of government? No, I don't think so. Margaret was Margaret. She was authoritarian, opinionated, um, and she was from the first day I met her in opposition um, before we went into government. Um, and, and, and you had to you had to tough it out. I mean, it was quite difficult. I, I mean, the language I'm now using I, it will make some people slightly uncomfortable, but. As a sort of middle class boy, I'd been brought up, you know, to stand up for women in buses, to sort of let women go through doors first and all that. That was what I was brought up to do. I got no complaints about it. It was just the way it was. And you didn't interrupt women and shout them down or anything like that. There was a, a deference. And uh, uh, so uh, when you come across it in politics, and you did with Margaret, because she would interrupt you and hector you and all that. Uh, your whole instinct was to say, yes, ma'am, <laughs> but you, you, you wouldn't fi survive five minutes if you did that. So you just had to, in cabinet, if, if you were producing a paper, you'd get the first three sentences out and she'd interrupt and deliver her view. And you had to wait until she shut up and start again. And she'd get the same thing, she'll interrupt you. And you had to wait and start again until she got the message that you were not going to be browbeaten uh, in the way that she was attempting to do. Uh, and, and uh, well, I had a pretty good relationship with Margaret. It's not widely recognized because it doesn't suit the storyline. But uh, the fact is that she promoted me uh, and she gave me, well, she let me get on with running my department. Do you remember the first time you met her? Uh, no, not really, but I remember the circumstances when she was... Uh, um, uh, I, was a, I was a spokesman for transport under Peter Walker. Peter Walker got moved and Margaret came in as the, uh, my boss. And it was a sea change. I mean, Peter was a, a supremely uh, agile politician and an opposition politician trying to win the hearts and minds. Margaret Bates was not 
naturally inclined to hearts and minds projects. And she would tell people what she thought and what, what they should do. And, uh, and it, it was sometimes quite embarrassing. But uh, we, ne we never, uh, you know, people, people often don't understand your colleagues in Parliament, not friends. Now, you may become friends, but no one, no one, no one, I never dreamt I would be a friend of Margaret. We had nothing in common. Um, uh, but um, as a colleague, it was perfectly all right for me to work for her. And the more I worked for her, the more she came to respect the job that I was doing, which was pretty supportive. I mean, in terms of running down government budget expenditure, my department went down from 52,000 to 39,000 in three years. And, you know, Margaret knew that. And so couldn't just say that I wasn't playing on the same piano key. And from that time, what are your funniest memories of the cabinet table? I think probably um, John Major and Ken Clark. Um, uh, I s s sat next to Ken, opposite John, and there was an occasion when a white-faced civil servant came in with a piece of folded paper, showed it to the Prime Minister, who looked at it aghast, passed, passed it across the table to Ken, who looked at it with dismay. No one said anything. Anyway, half an hour later, repeat performance. Another piece of paper passed across the table. And I'm not one of those people, although I say next to Ken, who sort of do the sort of eye over. He wanted to show me the piece of paper, he just showed it to me. Anyway, the end of the cabinet took place, and we all dispersed. The bits of paper left on the table. And I, I have to admit, I picked one up. 79 to 6. It was a cricket score. Um, at what stage did you make the decision to resign from cabinet? Oh, on the morning itself. Um, the way... You have to you have to know what the issue is all about, and the issue was all about my uh, right as a secretary of state to be heard by the cabinet on a major issue of policy, and uh, the, the major issue of policy centred on Western, the West Country Helicopter Company, where which was in financial trouble, and uh, uh, the Americans wanted to buy it. They wanted to buy it because they wanted to force the Ministry of Defence to buy the Black Hawk helicopter, which they were having great trouble in selling across the world. And uh, uh, I had just done the deal with the Eurofighter, so I knew all the Defence Secretaries of Europe. And uh, with the agreement of Leon Britain, uh, I set out to, to put together a package based on Europe, led by two British companies, uh, GEC and British Aerospace, and the, the helicopter industries of, uh, it must have been Spain, Italy, and Germany. Um, uh, so, so, that, so there were two deals. And um, Margaret was dead against there being a, a, a proper investigation and kept talking about the stock exchange and all that sort of thing. So there were three meetings. The first, quite legitimately, a small group of involved ministers where I put my case, and she had her case put, and she lost. I got a majority. So she wasn't pleased. She called an economic committee of the cabinet, which is the, the, the most important economic committee under the cabinet. And she even brought in the chairman of Westland, John Cutney, in order to persuade colleagues how important it was that they get on with the Americans. Uh, she lost. And at that stage, she summed up the meeting, saying there'll be a further meeting uh, after the stock exchange closes at five to three o'clock on Friday to resolve this matter. On the Tuesday, the meeting was called uh, by officials. On the Wednesday, it was cancelled, and I was never allowed to put the case to um, a cabinet. Uh, so th 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 we then got on to uh, the side of unfolded. And the point at which I resigned was when I said 
at cabinet, I want to explain my views. She said no. And she said, this has gone on long enough. And now we have a new change, and this was fundamental, a new change of arrangement whereby anyone involved, and that would mean obviously principally myself and, and the industry secretary, Leon Britton, ask questions about this matter, will refer the questions to the cabinet secretary, Robert Armstrong. And I immediately said, Prime Minister, does that mean that if I'm asked a question to which I provided the answer two days ago, I now have to say, I let you know and go back to Robert Armstrong for an answer, to which her reply was yes, to which I said no, because you don't need to be a sophisticated politician. Her uh, acolytes in Downing Street would have been onto the national press instantly. He's broken. Ask him a question. Go and ask him one of the questions. See what he says. You'll find he won't answer it because he's been shackled. And, uh, and across Europe, where my reputation was important as a NATO Secretary of State, they would hear, oh, we thought we'd back this guy. What happened? He's been silenced. Um, the British companies involved uh, in the defense industry they would have known, well, what does he matter? He can't even get his case put to cabinet. So I would have been humiliated, and I wasn't prepared to have that. So I left. And, but I took the decision there and then. I didn't think I was going to resign. I thought we'd somehow muddle our way through. And after that point, um, I, I think it's safe to say your reputation was, was for staying fairly or, or very loyal to the government. How did you find that transition um, to the backbenches? Well, I'd rather not to have done it, but I never had any doubt that I had to do it. And uh, I, um, I really concentrated on two issues. One was uh, the European issue, about which, of course, I had some knowledge. And secondly, about urban regeneration, which I've got considerable experience. So I stood, stuck to these two issues. And, um, but very rapidly, uh, Margaret was becoming more and more anti-European. And uh, of course, the, the, the journalists picked this up and started focusing her views against mine. And uh, I, I became, uh, well, uh, a, ahead of the protest to Margaret. And then, of course, she did the poll tax, which I had stopped her doing in the early years. And that was a catastrophic disaster. It would have lost us the uh, 19, uh, April, 1990 election, I think it was, yes, 1990. Um, but that, 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 was, that was real factor in the poll tax. And in terms of then the leadership contest, that later ensued. Can you talk us through the thought process that went into that? Well, uh, the, 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 there was a challenge, a guy called Anthony Mayer, uh, it would have been in, in, in 89, um, he, he didn't think he'd win, but he wanted to send a signal that, uh, uh, certainly I think over the European drift of events, that uh, the, there was a strong, um, protest on the back benches. He got about 70 or 80 votes. I played no part and, and I, I, didn't, I didn't vote for him. Um, uh, so I kept out of it. But of course, the moment that he failed, the press came to me and said, well, you wouldn't have failed, would you? Uh, he was never credible as, as a potential leader, but you are. And uh, so what are you going to do? And I, I carried all that and said, you know, I stayed loyal to the Conservative Party. The thing that absolutely uh, threw a rock in the pool was Geoffrey Howe's resignation, about which I knew nothing. Although Geoffrey was a very good friend of mine, he, he never told me how, we never discussed the position uh, of his possible resignation. But when, the words he used, it is now for others to determine uh, the way forward. Um, I was sitting just behind him, and I heard those words. I thought, oh, that's me. The press will be all over me, uh, which, of course, they were. Curiously enough, years later, 
Jeffrey's private secretary told me, no, he didn't mean you at all. When he said it's now for others, he was thinking about the cabinet, which of course Margaret consulted and, and, and she was told the game was over. Um, but uh, um, anyway, um, that's how it all happened. Uh, and my position was a pretty lonely one. Do I take up Jeffrey's challenge or do I run away? And that was the way everybody put it to me at the time. How would you characterize your relationship with John Major once he became leader? Well, I, I, I think the, the, uh, John and I hardly knew each other because he's a different generation and he really had risen to the ranks of the Tory party after I'd left um, the government. So uh, uh, I don't know what he thought. Uh, he hardly knew me. Uh, but I suspect that he was not uninfluenced by the general view that I was out there scheming to bring Margaret down and all that sort of stuff, which I wasn't. But, um, uh, but all I can tell you, and this is, the, this is where the facts become relevant, is that the campaign by Douglas Hurd and John Major and myself was unbelievably well conducted. There was no bitterness, no harsh language, nothing. And... Uh, so John immediately asked me to join his government. Uh, I, I went back with pleasure. I suspect he would legitimately have looked at me a bit askance in the early years. Who is this guy? What's he really like? Look what he did to Margaret. You know, all that. Anybody would have asked those questions. But he made me his deputy. And I think that really answers all the questions. Did you prefer serving in his cabinet to the cabinets of Margaret Thatcher? Oh, I liked both. Uh, because uh, the jobs, curious enough, in, in, the, um, uh, in, in, in both Margaret and John's cabinet, I was secretary of the environment uh, for a significant period of time. Um, in, in under John, I, I went to industry as well, which I, I much enjoyed. Um, but um, no, I enjoyed it. It's a hugely rewarding job as a cabinet minister, hugely. And I enjoyed the whole thing enormously. I, I deeply resent that I spent four years on the bank benches when the Tories were in power. Who do you think the greatest politician not to have become prime minister um, who you worked with was? Oh, one of these very difficult. I suppose Enoch Powell might well have been a, an outstanding uh, Prime Minister. Um, Roy Jenkins, perhaps. Um, difficult to tell because uh, you never know really what they're going to be like and what they're going to do. And you never know, I mean, you take Boris's situation. Nobody could have foreseen that Boris would face the COVID crisis that he has. I mean, and, and he's come out of it with flying colours, without any doubt. Uh, COVID completely dominates the thinking process of the body politic today, and it will do so for quite a bit yet. Are you, are you surprised by how Boris has done in the recent local elections? Uh, not really. I mean, I know Boris. Well, he took over from me at uh, Henley, and we had a very good relationship. Um, uh, it, it, he, he likes people, he likes being liked, uh, he likes being popular, um, and um, he likes the job, and he, he likes winning. Um, so all these things have, have come through. Uh, of course, I find it very difficult to give the Brexit leap, which I suspect was a, an opportunist decision rather than a principal one. And against this backdrop of a Conservative Party with, um, with a leader who likes winning and a track record of being in government for the vast majority of the last century, is there a future for Labour in government? I, I would think so. Um, I, see, I think we're living in a very artificial position at the moment. Um, the, the Brexit result in my view, was a, a consequence of the economic frustrations of the time. Uh, it, it certainly after the 2008 crisis, there, there, there was very difficult 
people to enjoy rising living standards, and there was a resentment. The Conservatives turned that resentment into Brexit. Uh, you had to have someone to blame, and the best possible person to blame is the foreigner of one sort or another, immigrants, foreigners, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, and uh, we, we've now had COVID, which has created a much more dramatic economic uh, uh, crisis. But the government, within my, in my view, has actually turned that to their advantage by making a success of the, um, the fight back. And I think they're entitled. I mean, easy to say I would have done, this is what they should have done. There will be plenty of people saying that. But by and large, I think the public, public is in benefit of the doubt, and in my view, rightly so. But the underlying economic malaise is still there. And we're now looking at a situation where we have borrowing on a horrendous scale, last seen at the end of the Second World War, uh, and we have uh, uncertainty about how far, to what extent the market will recover. If that it will recover, that it will recover quickly, I haven't the slightest doubt. The issue is where does it go compared with where it was before the crisis of COVID? And when you clear away COVID, then you come stunk face to face with Brexit. And Brexit is a disaster for this country. Um, the, the issues are there, people know they're there, but they're buried under COVID at the moment. You know, the fishermen are fed up, Northern Ireland's in trouble, Scotland's tinkering on the brink, um, and the city doesn't know what its new regulation is going to be vis a vis Europe. You can go on and on and on. But all of that will become the backdrop of the latter part of this government and against the background where someone has to pay the bills. And, and on the question of Scotland and Northern Ireland, what do you think the prospects for the Union are? Well, it, it, you know, you can whistle in the dark. I want, I'm totally opposed to the fragmentation of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and um, so I'm going to tell you, I hope that it will remain intact. But, but when you look at the facts, it is so perilous that it, it, I, 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 I don't believe you can make a rational judgment saying that it will be all right on the night. It may be, I'd like it to be, try to make it help, but there's a big risk. And perhaps a final question uh, on which to end. What's the greatest piece of advice you ever received? I ever received? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, Enoch, Enoch um, Ian MacLeod, um, in, uh, when I was president of the Union. And you know, well, you know exactly this. You have these great distinguished speakers and you have to entertain them over dinner before the debates. And uh, the conversation got round to my political career. And uh, um, Ian, Ian said to me, what do you want to do? I'd like to get in the House of Commons. Would you like to be a minister? Well, I, I didn't say, of course, but I, I said, well, yes, that would be nice. Any particular office? And I said, home office. Which he said, graveyard of politics, young man. Graveyard of politics. So when John Major offered me the job, in 1992, I said no. Lord Hesseltine, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to the Cambridge Union this afternoon. We are incredibly grateful and hope that we will one day be able to welcome you back to um, the physical union, as it were. Thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a lovely afternoon. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.